Shore Baptist Church on Monday, Thursday's lunch. They've asked me to speak on the topic of the shed blood of Jesus. Uh, what, is, what is the nature of the power that's in his blood? Uh, maybe you know some of those old hymns. Uh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So uh, we have hymns of uh, there's uh, there, uh, another hymn, Something in the Blood of the Lamb. What's the, you know, the power. power in the blood? Power in the blood? Right. Um, uh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that blood. Lose all their guilty stains. All their guilty stains. All right. Um, uh, Fanny Crosby. Y'all know the story of Fanny Crosby, lost her eyesight as a child, became one of the great hymn writers. A lot of the hymns in, in, our, in our litany of hymns written by her, and she wrote a song, Redeemed, Redeemed, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, his child and forever I am. And the list of hymns that celebrate the power of the shed blood of Christ, they just go on and on and on and on. Um, Everybody in here, would you agree to the fact that there's power in the blood? Yes. Yeah, right? well, that is a, every time I ask that question, I get that kind of response, okay? Nobody is indifferent or, you know, take it or leave it. We, we understand the centrality of that. Now, my sermon that I preached on Sunday, we, we follow a slain lamb. Jesus is a lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. We, we overcome by two things in the book of book of Revelation. Revelation 12, 11 says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and our testimony. Alright? So so that sits um, at the center of what we do. But the question, here's the question that I've been tinkering with and that's been a more challenging question to answer is as, as precise as possible how does blood atone? How is it that liquid hemoglobin and platelets extracted from a body and applied in a particular way how does that how does that set us in a right relationship with God um, and then with the with the gospel or, the, or the, the message of the death and resurrection of Christ how is it that a Jewish man who died on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago shedding his blood on the cross how does that act and that fact the shedding of that blood deal with Don's sin today I got to thinking about that and that's a the, that it's stated throughout the scriptures but we don't get a ton of explanation about how it is that blood being shed alters the disposition between me and a holy God. All right? So, uh, I, I, but the Bible does say some things about it that are important, but I wanted to sort of get your thoughts on it. We might have a conversation about it because I'm still working my way through and preparing this, and sometimes I need the help of my room full of theological experts here on, uh, on Tuesday mornings. And also, this, this is expressly related again to uh, the call to pray and how it is that we uh, can pray effectively. In fact, we'll, we'll just let that be our launch point. So, in, uh, the book of the New Testament in which blood is mentioned the most is the book of Hebrews. All right. So, if you really want to find a lot of information about blood, you find it in Hebrews. Hebrews uses the word blood twenty times, uh, and that's a, 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 a quite a bit more than any other single book of the New Testament mentions blood. This verse I'm going to start with doesn't mention blood, but it does mention access. And so one of the things that's clear from Scripture is there is a relationship between shed blood and access to the Father. All right? And now we'll trace that all the way back to Leviticus. But would you agree with me that there's, there's, there's a relationship between blood being shed and a sinner like me actually having access to the Father? All right, so Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Paul's been, uh, Paul, the, the writer of Hebrews, 
uh, is has been making a long argument about how we can enter rest, and he starts to introduce uh, an idea that he's going to tease out in the next several chapters about Jesus being our high priest. The the theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is better, right? What is Jesus better than in the book of Hebrews? Anybody remember that from your study? Yeah, he's, 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 he's better than everything, but specifically, what are some things that Jesus is better than? He's better than the high priest. He's better than, the high priest. He's better. He's better than angels. Better than, better, better than the old sacrificial system of the old covenant. Better and so better blood. Better than Moses. Better than Moses. That's right. Very good. And so and he just keeps on the the Jewish Christians are being tempted to go back into the synagogue, and the writer of Hebrews says, "Why in the world would you do that? Something better has come. Why would you take the?" Why would you take the lesser when the, when the better has been manifested in Christ? And so he's turning his attention now, getting ready to make the argument that Jesus is a better high priest. And so he says, verse 14, Since therefore we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, uh, and in, these, in the chapters to come, the, the argument is going to be made that, the, that Jesus passes through the heavens into the heavenly sanctuary through his blood. He's not going to make that argument yet, but he's setting that up. We have this high priest who has access uh, to the heavenly places. The Son of God, we can hold fast to this confession. Verse 15, we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all things that as we are yet without sin. So we have a blemishless high priest. And so the other thing that we'll see is how Jesus marries together all the different aspects. Jesus is not only a high priest, but what else is Jesus at the same time? He's also the sacrifice. He's also the lamb, right? He's all these things together at the same time. And then here, here's, the, here's the payoff for us this morning. Therefore, therefore, what's a, when, when we read therefore in the Bible, what's it there for? <laughs> it's to say everything that I just said, here's the payoff. If these things that I just said are true, here's the payoff. Jesus is a, is a high priest. He's sympathetic to us. And he doesn't have any blemishes. Yet he understands everything we've been through. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. That's a good promise for our praying. What can we do in our praying? What is this instruction? We can go boldly. We can go with confidence. Because you're all such great guys. That's why you can go with confidence uh, to the throne of grace? I reckon not. <laughs> why, why can you go boldly? Because Jesus has, has made the way for us. He's gone and he's, he's, our, he, he goes, he's our pioneer. It's, a, it's a, kind of a, a good translation of, the, of Jesus being the author and perfecter of our faith, which is Hebrews 12. <laughs> Jesus has made a way for us, and now we can go with confidence into this place that we do not have access to without something uh, that's been done to us. So this argument will start to unfold. It gets all the way to chapter 9, and I think about half the references to blood in Hebrews are in Hebrews 9, in this passage in Hebrews 9 that begins uh, uh, with verse 6 of chapter 9. Now, when all these things have been so prepared, and so the, uh, the, the writer has... Uh, uh, is laying out the, the Day of Atonement and the tabernacle is uh, is set up and, and all these things have been prepared. Uh, the priests are continually uh, entering the outer tabernacle performing the, the divine worship, but into the second, into the most holy place, into the Holy of Holies, the, only the high priest can enter. How often can the high priest enter the Holy of Holies? Once a year. Once a year. Once a year. All right. One time a year he can go there. And not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect and conscious, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body in prison until the time of reformation. So, the... The, the argument that's being made here is the uh, until the time of Christ, uh, 
<clears throat> Judaism really only let you get into the outer court. That's as far as it could take you. And then there was one person who could go one time a year to go into the holy place. But how many how many people could go in? One. 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 How often? Once a year. Once a year. Is that going to work for you? Do you, need, do you just need access one day a year? <laughs> no. No. How much access do you need? Oh, you need it all the time, right? And so the outer court and the, and the earthly tabernacle is, point, is, is pointing towards the ultimate that is to come. Uh, verse 11, but when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that's to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered into the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling uh, those who have been uh, defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So Jesus is this better sacrifice that can cleanse not only on the outside, but it cleanses to the very core of who we are. Uh, the sacrifice, as, as being mentioned, is only sufficient to expunge the sins done in ignorance. Did y'all see that part? What sacrifices were available for the sin with a high hand? No sacrifice for that. That's why when David throws himself on the mercy of God after murdering and, uh, and, and stealing a man's wife, if he, if he, if, why is David doing that? He's throwing himself on the mercy of God. Why? Because there's, no there's no sacrifice for what he's done. He's toast. Is that the only kind of sacrifice you fellers need? It's just a sacrifice for your ignorance? No, we sin with a high hand. We do things on purpose that we know God has told us not to do, but we're going to do it anyway because we know better. And that puts us in a desperate situation. With us. And so what's owed at that point? How do you pay that debt? You don't with your death. <laughs> and it still doesn't get paid, but that's the cost, that's the price of it. That's the penalty, is your death. Okay, so hold all those things together in your mind. So still the question is, how does blood do this? How does blood do this? Because frankly, now we're accustomed to hearing about shed blood and that sort of thing, but just try to peel off your, your predisposition and just think about the fact that for millennia, uh, the, in, the religious instinct of people when they wanted to try to find some kind of connection with God because animal sacrifice is universal. So wrapped up in a, the religious impulse of people is to kill an animal, pour out its blood, chop it up, and burn it. Now, is that something you, you guys do? I know you barbecue on a regular, <laughs> very regular basis, but... Because one of the, one, and this is another rabbit trail, I'll, I'll chase it some other time. Animal sacrifice is universal when Christ comes. And then within about 150 years, animal sacrifice is gone from the Roman Empire as Christianity spreads. It's, it's a stunning, it's a, it's a stunning change. That, that's how decisive the work of Christ is, is that it, it eliminates the universal human impulse to, to uh, in fact, that's what it does everywhere where the gospel goes. So, but how? How how does blood, again, red, liquid, hemoglobin, platelet-filled substance deal with sin? Any, shout it out if you got some ideas and then we'll, we'll jump to something, all right? I'm not a biologist. Okay. It's because the creator of the universe set up this process, and he said, this is the process. Very good. All right. So thing one. So let's jump to the, the, the clearest explanation in the scripture about how blood atones. It's interesting. Yes, go ahead. There's no remission of sin without the All right. So that we, we keep going here, and that's how that's in, actually in Hebrews 9. Um, 
uh, verse 22, and according to the law, what may almost say, all things are uh, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, there's no remission of sin. So that's from Romans, that's a not, that's from Hebrews 9. Okay? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. But once again, I, I guess what I'm trying to sort of squeeze down is how? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. But that 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 says it, but it doesn't explain how it is. That, we got a transfusion? All right. <laughs> right? Okay. Is there a transfusion? And is that is is that it works? Is there's there's a little truth rattling around in that as well. Well, let's jump to the text upon which Hebrews 9 sits, which is in Leviticus 17. All right, in Leviticus. Leviticus 16 is Day of Atonement. And then Leviticus 17, uh, most of this chapter deals with blood. And what you do and don't do with blood. All right? And then Leviticus 16 and 17 are, are in the geographical center of the book of Leviticus. Anybody know what the theme of the book of Leviticus is or what the point of the book of Leviticus how is? To, how to. How to what? <laughs> do get what we're asking for here it's a levitical law and so without the law there's no hope for them and and let me say i have pictured the old testament of having all the requirements to commune with god you carry them and so you carry the tabernacle you carry the ark you 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 move but you carry them for a while and when Jesus shows up, he says, okay, now I'll carry it. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that you've got all of these things are pointing to Christ and will be, will be fulfilled in him. Okay? But, so, but, but Leviticus, but, so Dennis says that Leviticus helps us. And, and but specifically, what is Leviticus helping God's people to do? Follow the law. And well, to follow the law, but what's the point of the following of the law? Okay, it's and specifically with Leviticus, it's how we can come into the presence of a holy God. And so Leviticus gives us, as it moves to the center, uh, it gives us an explanation of the sacrifices to, to make, it gives a description of the priesthood, and it gives us a description of how we can be ready to to enter into worship, and then the and then the center. Of the center is the Day of Atonement and this blood, blood sacrifice that's given. All right? So how to have a relationship with the Holy God. The, in chapter 1, Moses is outside of the tent of meeting. Okay, so the question is how can Moses go inside? How can the people of Israel go inside the tent of meeting to meet with the true living God? First chapter of Numbers, Moses, the Lord speaks to Moses inside the tent. So, and so Leviticus is helping to put us in relationship with the Holy God. And what's the problem with us having a relationship with the Holy God? We're unholy. We're unholy, all right? So we are, there's a, there's a barrier between us and this Holy God, and what is the barrier? Sin. Sin. Very, very good, all right? So, how to deal with our sin. How, without any help, is your sin dealt with? How does, how does that get squared up? God, God demands righteousness and you're, it's wrath. Okay. Right. So what's the what's the penalty? Death. Eternal death. You're right. But before Christ comes, a death is it's the penalty for the wages of sin. For, for disobeying a holy God is that you owe a death. And again, that's a pretty expensive that's a pretty expensive penalty. There's no more you after that's over. And so so what do we need if 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 uh, uh, rather than having to die yourself, a you need a substitute. You need an acceptable substitute that can stand in for you, but not only something that you might flippantly pay off, but it has to be a costly sacrifice. It has to be one that um, not only alters objectively your relationship with the. Uh, with the Father, but it subjectively changes your disposition. In fact, it requires you to have a heart of repentance. That's spelled out in Deuteronomy. If, a, if an Israelite goes in uh, with a sacrifice, but he's saying in his heart, I'm going to do whatever I want. Is that, that going to work? Mm -hmm. Nope. 
just going through the motions, and that was Israel's problem all along, external religion without in, internal heart change. So we've got to have a sacrifice that's costly and significant and uh, it changes us objectively and subjectively. So here we go. So it's really just down to one verse. Hebrews 17, 11 says, put my glasses on. Hebrews or Leviticus? I'm sorry, Leviticus. Thank you. Thank you. Leviticus 17, 11. <laughs> so, before I read this verse, the instruction is you can't ingest blood at all. Even if you're just killing a, a, an animal to, to eat. You, not only can you not ingest the blood, you have to... You have to Dispose of the blood the way I tell you. You can't keep the blood. You can't splash it on stuff. You you uh, have to do with you have to dispose. dispose of blood the way I tell you to dispose of it. And interestingly, all animals that were killed to eat had to be killed at the tabernacle. I didn't know this until I read this study. But if you were just going to kill a you're having a, a wedding celebration and you're going to have a goat or the fatted calf or whatever, you had to go to the tabernacle and kill it and give the blood to the priests before you could have your barbecue. Did you all know that? No. I didn't. I didn't remember it anyway. So blood, very important. Now, also it's very likely that blood and the misuse of blood was a part of the paganism that the Israelites were involved in when they were in Egypt. And so they kind of keep blood and sprinkle it on stuff and wipe it on stuff and that sort of thing to other gods. And so part of this is, is teaching them, I don't want you making sacrifices elsewhere. I don't want you slinging blood around stuff outside of the, of the tabernacle. So don't eat blood. Don't do stuff with it that I told you not to do with it. Verse 11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is... For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. I just want to read that verse again. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. There you go. And so, I say there you go. How does that strike you? What what jumps out of that verse? It's my life source, and this is just something I've you know that we're taught that uh, sin pr produces death, and I've learned. Someone told me once that even though my eternity is secure, that my sin now causes a death to the opportunity. Of what I, if I would have done something right, I've always now lost that opportunity in that particular circumstance. Very good. And so, so here's the, so that's a so that's a great observation and important. When we talk about sin leading to death, that's not a metaphor. Okay, it's true. Now, just like in the Garden of Eden, they were told, "You eat from this fruit." You're, you'll surely die. Now, did they did they physically die that moment? No, but but death entered the, the the loss. First of all, the loss of lots and lots and lots of things, and then ultimately the the, the loss of everything is actually the consequence for sin. I mean, we know this, right? If you continue. To rebel against the true and living God, what is the what's the consequence of that for you? You just wreck everything around you until it swallows, it, until it destroys your life. That's what that isn't what sin metaphorically does. That's what sin actually does. So we have an actual death problem. Okay. And, and, and Wayne, I've been thinking about metaphors the whole time you've been talking. Because here they use blood as life, but a metaphor because they don't understand. It. Like we can have transfusion stay and all that stuff, you know. But I'm, I'm having a little trouble making the leap because there are two leaps you have to make here. I mean, you you make the leap that uh, 
blood, it's the actual blood. I mean, there are people who believe you drink communion wine and then it turns into blood. Oh, yeah. You see yeah. all that stuff. Uh -huh. And to me, it's the fact that they were making sacrifices back then. It was the, the metaphor of turning it over and getting rid of the wine, taking the best of your flock or whatever. And that was the metaphor for for getting on your knees before God. And, and Jesus dying, did, is it the actual blood or the, the fact, the metaphor that he was willing to put his life down to save us? That, that's what I'm struggling with. Yes. And the actual blood as opposed to the fact that he was willing to give his life for us. Yes. So, right. So hang on to that thought. Because <laughs> what, what you start to realize, and this is, what I've learned is I kind of wrestled around with this. I mean, where I've, where I've landed is you have this amazing truth. It's deeper and beyond what we can comprehend. I guess one of the cool things that you walk away from is when I asked you about those hymns, you all know the hymns about the blood, right? Because you know at a deep level, what can wash away my sin? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Explain that to me. You're like, I can't really explain it. But I know it in a, in a supernatural way be beyond comprehension because the truth is what we need is a forgiveness that's beyond comprehension we need a we need a super abundant and, and deep and, and wide uh, action of the father so so here you go so here's what i think is oh any other thoughts about this one because you really come it comes down to this one verse that it is jam-packed <clears throat> so what are the what are some of the key words in leviticus 17 11 Life is in the okay, book. life. And the word for life is a very unusual word that's used in Leviticus. It's nefesh. And it's, it's, all of its uses are almost in these, these handful of verses. And so it means life. It means your soul. It's a very, very, very important and comprehensive uh, word for us. Okay, so life. What are some of the other words? Okay, but but in this in this text, flesh. Okay, life is in the flesh. Basar is the Hebrew word there, and it's interesting because it speaks. It's it's a universal word for flesh, not only the flesh of human beings, but the flesh of of animals. Life is in the flesh. What is it? All right, <laughs> given to you. Very good. And this goes back to what Sam observed, and, I, and I'll touch it on it in a second, but, that, but that's not to be missed. I've given this to you. What to, to, and God's given this to you for what purpose? So that you can be atoned. Kippur, Yom Kippur, you're familiar with the term Yom Kippur? That's the day of atonement, Kippur. And Kippur is one of those words that has 50 English words that try to translate it because it is, Kapoor means cover, redeem, expiate, propitiate, mm -hmm. ransom. It's, it is the, one of those deep Hebrew words. But the fundament is that it puts, puts things in back in right relationship that have been, been, been broken apart. Oh, the Kapoor is the um, mercy seat. Look, it's the covering of the ark. So this whole idea of covering or sin being covered uh, is there. And so the Kippur is the, is the, is the mercy seat. So it is the thing uh, that, that makes atonement. So let me start to cut to the chase just a little bit. Well, or anything else. So you've got blood, uh, which is dam, life, nefesh, atonement, Kippur, flesh, basar. It's given for you. All right, so here, here are three things as I see it, and y'all can help me if you, if, if you think this uh, makes sense to you. First of all, it's very, very, very important to note that it's something that God has given us to make atonement. And I think, Wayne, this some sense answers your question is, when you boil it down, uh, we needed something as a substitute to, to make atonement. Because if God doesn't give us something to make atonement, where does that leave us? Well, we're just dead. We're dead. <clears throat> and so the first 
thing to know about blood is blood is a, is a demonstration of God's grace. God's decided in grace and mercy to let liquid red hemoglobin be something that he'll accept in the place of your death. It is a demonstration of grace. It is a gift to you. So that's thing one is God in mercy has made a way for us to have something besides our own death uh, to count. All right? Then secondly, what does, what does shed blood signify? What, what, does the, what does it mean for blood to be shed? What happens when you shed blood? It dies. Okay. There's a death when the ancient people knew that when you let all the blood out of something and when you let a lot of blood out of something, what would happen? Okay. There's a death, right? And also the other, so you can let the, you can let blood out. What's another way to, to cause a, a, something to die? Suffocate. You can suffocate it. And so nefesh, you can hear that nefesh, speaks of our breath. And so the two ways that ancient people would have viewed a key element that, that sustains life is blood and breath. And so you have blood and breath here uh, in this passage as well. And so uh, shedding blood represents a death, right? the death of, of, of something that's very valuable. That's why people brought um, a sacrificial lamb and then with, with Passover it was it was very specifically a lamb that was sort of hand raised. It was a it was but all of their livestock. Where do you get your meat? In the woods. The store, right? You know, some of you get in the woods, but where do you mostly get your meat? At the grocery store. Okay, it comes in a little plastic package. And so we're very we are very distanced from the process. Of procuring meat, but any of you done any deer hunting and deer dressing? Yep. Okay. How does that experience differentiate from going to Win Dixie and picking up a palm roast? It's personal. It's personal. It's bloody. It's messy. It's you have a sense of the cost as that deer hanging upside down, looking at you with those glassy dead eyes, you know, and it, and and it's been expensive for the deer, all right? And, it, and what I always find in hunting, and you'll even watch, watch this, is there, there is a sense of the sacredness of it. I think you, you get that from hunters, that they're not, uh, they're not flippant about that, of something's lost its life. So there's a death, um, and something has to die. Something has to die. So... Shed blood means death. So that's the second thing, is that God has, in his grace, he's allowed for there to be a sacrifice. The sacrifice that's required is a death. And so instead of us dying, he's accepting the death of this sacrificial animal in our place. And then, what's the, what's the other thing that we learn about the nature of the value or significance of the blood? Why is blood significant? Why can blood atone? And it's mentioned here in this text. Because of what? Why? is the life that's in it. So not only does it speak of a death, but it also speaks of life given. Um, what have you come to find? Let's see if I can get this question the right way. What have you come to find about how the joy of the Christian life increases? What, what do you find makes the joy of your Walk with the Lord deepen. The, the, the price that was paid, if we can grasp that, and may I say that Adam and Eve were in the garden. Uh, they sinned. They had then hidden from each other because they realized they were naked. God showed up, and the end of the story is God made a covering for their sin. They called it sin. Don't know if he did, but they called it sin. And in the, in the wilderness a um, cry was heard of the first animal that was sacrificed to cover their sin. And as a kid, I, my grandfather had a meat packing house pigs and shoot them behind the ear, bleed them on the spot, 
and then take them in and chop them up. And I watch that over and over and over again. And it's personal. Yeah. My uncle who sat on the fence and pulled the trigger, he, he said, he, he just, it, it traumatized yeah. him over life. Well, that's right. So you have, you have, and we, and we, because we don't live in a slaughterhouse world, we don't have a sense of the, the cost of that. All right. So, so it's death. But again, here's my question. As we turn to the significance of the life that's in the blood, what, I, I don't know if this is a good question, but I'm going to try to ask it again. What increases your joy in the Christian life? What do you, what do you find it's recognizing who God is, praising Him, and in communication, recognizing yeah. my joy comes from the fact that my name is written in heaven. Yeah. And yeah. The name of life. All right, so there's a change of disposition. The, the part of the joy is it wasn't me. <coughs> It was somebody else who did that for me. And if we ever grasp the magnitude of that, it is life-changing. Yeah, I, I got it. And, and that's that's that objective part. Maybe I'm looking for a little bit more subjective. Are Just, your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Right, right. So, in the blood of the yeah, we've... Uh, the joy for me is walking in alignment. When I feel like... There you I'm go. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking, looking for. So there's this objective change. The blood, what we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb that, is, that has... And everything and it's this crazy deal right that god goes ahead and decides to give us everything now instead of making us wait to the end or wait till we've earned it or wait till we've proven it because forget that but not only does he not make us earn it but he doesn't even make us wait you can go ahead and rest firmly secure that because of what somebody else did for you that's credited to your account and so that's that objective element but what i also find that when I am walking in alignment with the Father, when I'm serving on a, on, on a mission team, when I'm sharing my faith with someone, when I'm obedient, when I'm doing the hard thing that I've been asked to do, that I struggle over until I do what the Lord has asked me to do, and then the joy that I experience from saying, God, my, have my life. When are you the most miserable? When you've done what you want to do. When you've made demands and insisted on things and acted like a fool and, and, and behaved out of alignment it's miserable so here's the point the life that's in it ultimately what human beings need to need to know and, and need to have and long for is that their life is rendered to something worthy their life is expended in something that's eternal that matters not wasted not thrown away that's when you talk to people who feel bad about themselves and bad about their lives, they'll say something like, I threw my life away. I, I wasted my, my, my opportunity to do something significant with this life that I've been given. And so this, as Wayne was pointing out, almost this drama of sacrifice is it, it is a way in the Old Testament for the worshiper to say, have my life. It's, it, and it really is... Uh, um, in Genesis 22, when Abraham takes Isaac to sacrifice Isaac, really the heart of the sacrificial system is that we would give ourselves or we would give the thing that's most valuable to us. Um, when David, get, remember when David's mighty men bring him back the water from Bethlehem and he said he was thirsty? Do remember, you remember what David does with that water? The mighty men go behind enemy lines to get this water for David. Bring the water back to David because he said, I'm so thirsty for some water from my hometown. And what does David do with the water? Pour it out as a sacrifice. Pour it out. When I read that and noticed after the very first time, I thought, I've been hacked if I was those mighty men and put my life on the line. And, but David says, this is a perfect sacrifice. This is the life. Because my men sacrificed their lives to bring this to me, this is their life. This is the, It would be like me drinking their blood. And so I poured out for the, for, for the Lord. What better gift than to give the best thing I've ever gotten to the best one who, who is. And when we do that, when we give ourselves wholly and completely to the one who's worthy, we don't have less. What happens when you give yourself completely to the Lord? Are you bereft? You have, you, you, you're, you're left with nothing? No. What do you get? Everything. You get everything. It's this, again, this crazy deal. You get everything. Forgiving everything. What do you get if you keep everything? Whatever you keep. <laughs> <laughs> what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his nephesh? 
is probably the word that that Jesus used in Aramaic. Right? So you have grace, death, life. And blood wraps all those things together. It's a God has just decided I'm gonna I'm gonna let blood count. And and though ultimately you can't understand why, ultimately why I've let it let the blood of an animal count for your life, but by golly, the alternative is not very good. And so because I'm a God of grace, I'm going to let something count instead. But just because you can't understand it all doesn't mean there's not truth revealed in that. And so what's bound up with blood is death. And here's what you got to catch. It should have been me. That's what Maundy Thursday is about. It should have been you. It should have been you laying on that altar. In fact, you weren't even qualified. You wouldn't even be qualified as a sacrifice because you're, you're, you're sinful and blemished and broken and then it's a it's because of the life that's in the blood the most glorious gift that a human being can receive is the, the beauty of being able to surrender their lives completely to the one who's worthy and in in the blood we have all of those things and then the triumph is that it's Christ and so Christ is this gift to us. It's his shed blood for us. He dies in our place. And why is he qualified to die in our place? We learned this just a second ago in the book of Hebrews. Sinless. Because he never sinned. He's a blemishless, spotless lamb. He never sinned. Tempted in every way. Didn't sin, so he's qualified to die in our place. He died the death we should have died. But what did he also do? He lived, lived the life we should have lived. And how did Jesus live his life? Perfectly blameless wholly surrendered to the will of the Father. So yes, it was perfect. Yes, it was sinless. But it was wholly surrendered to the will of the Father. And what, what happens when an image bearer lives his life wholly surrendered to the will of the Father? What happens out of that life? Woo! The kingdom comes. Power and redemption. And Jesus makes that possible and then swoops us up by allowing us, because the, the ultimate goal for your life through the sacrifice of Christ, Romans 12 tells us what? Uh, um, I urge you therefore by the mercies of God Super to present Super yourselves a living sacrifice as living sacrifices, pleasing to the Lord at your spiritual service of worship. And you can't do that without what Christ has done for you. But then you're you're swept up into that kind of life. All right. I've traveled way around the world. And, and all of this gives us the ability to pray. And so never forget that. It ought, to, it, ought to, it ought to cause you to weep. Every time you utter a word to the Lord, you can approach the throne of grace, throne of grace because of what Christ has done for you with his blood. All right. So things to pray for. What are we going to pray for? And the power of the blood in the, in the name of Jesus. <coughs>